the skies over Japan. August the 9th, 1945. America is about to drop its second atomic bomb in three days. Within seconds, 30% of Nagasaki is flattened. And more than 40,000 people vaporized. Five days later, Japan surrenders. This new superweapon is used twice to shorten the war and save American lives. That's the accepted story. But some are now challenging that history. The bomb was used and therefore, no matter how horrible it was, it was justified. This is a myth. Disasters don't just happen. They're triggered by a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. The Central Pacific. Tinian Air Base. August the 9th, 1945. Sergeant William Barney and his colleagues from the 509th Composite Group are gathering for a top-secret bombing mission. They are to drop Fat Man on Japan, America's second atomic bomb. The first, Little Boy, hit Hiroshima three days earlier. The U.S. are hoping to bomb Japan into surrender. All of us kind of thought maybe that would be it. We hoped it would end the war. Barney is the radar operator on the plane The Great Artiste, one of the three key planes involved in the mission. Its job is to take measurements of the blast. Big Stink will film the explosion, and Boxcar will drop the bomb. 2,500 kilometers away on the islands of Japan, For eight and a half months, its major cities have been razed to the ground as the U.S. Air Force carry out saturation bombing raids. Across the country, families like Sakui Shimohira's are living in fear of the next attack. <laughs> We had often slept inside the air raid shelter, but the night of the 8th, for the first time in a long time, we slept at home. 2.49 a.m. B-29 Superfortress boxcar takes off. pilot, Major Sweeney, is the leader of the mission. Bombardier Bean is the man in charge of releasing the bomb. At the back of the plane sits Jim Van Pelt, the navigator, and Commander Ashworth, the man on board who best knows how the bomb works. The crew settles in for a five-hour flight. First, they will regroup over the island of Yakushima. Then they'll travel in convoy to their target, the city of Kokura. Seven fifty a.m. A U.S. plane flies over Sakui's home. My mother quickly woke us all up and said, 
Hurry to the air raid shelter. We might be bombed. She told us, under no circumstances, leave the shelter or come home. A few kilometers away, 18-year-old Sumitero Taneguchi is delivering letters. When you work for the post office, you couldn't stop working just because the air raid warning sounded. So I didn't take refuge at the shelter. It's a reconnaissance plane checking the weather, not a bomber. So the air raid warning is lifted. People start streaming back out of the shelters. But uneasy, Sakui's mother has ordered her and her sister to stay put. Eight ten a.m. Boxcar approaches Yakushima Island. Camp. Roger that, Jim. Beginning ascent on bombing altitude. Great Art East arrives soon after. Boxcar was already there. The third plane had not showed up. The big stink is nowhere to be seen. Under strict orders to maintain radio silence, the crews can't contact the missing plane. They start circling. While we was there, we received the reports from our weather planes. The weather over Kokura is clear. The crew's orders are that the bomb should only be dropped if they get a visual on the target. So, they're good to go, once the extinct arrives. We got there and we waited. Theoretically, we're supposed to wait 15 minutes. Meanwhile, 276 kilometers away, in Nagasaki, 10-year-old Sakui is still in the air raid shelter with her sister and nephew. We sat on the straw mats, and we felt very relieved. 8.50 a.m. Boxcar and the great artiste have been circling for 40 minutes. A problem with a fuel tank means Boxcar's range is restricted. And she's the one with Fat Man in her bomb bay. Every second they wait burns precious fuel. What's the holdup? Hopkins, no sign of the Big Stink yet. With Big Stink only carrying recording equipment, there's no need for the other two planes to wait. Sweeney has a decision to make. To hell with it, we can't wait any longer. He gives the go signal to Great Artiste. Both planes head for the city of Kokura, 390 kilometers away. 9.20 a.m. The two planes approach the city. Whether it started to set in. 9.45 a.m. The clear skies reported by the weather plane an hour ago have given way to clouds. Sweeney signals the start of the bombing run.
Well, I had three runs. We just couldn't see. 10.30 a.m. Sweeney calls off the attack on Kukura. The abortive mission has cost 45 minutes of fuel. Jim, take us to secondary target, Nagasaki. 156 kilometers away, Nagasaki, the city where Sakue and Sumitaro live. What's our fuel status? Only 1,500 gallons, sir. It's just enough fuel to reach Nagasaki and safely get back to base. But only if they lighten the plane's load. They need to drop the bomb, whatever the weather conditions. Ashworth, will you accept a radar run if we cannot see the target? As the weaponeer, only Ashworth has the authority to switch to a radar drop. Yeah, it's Nagasaki. Radar or visual, but drop we will. Ten fifty-six a.m. Boxcar and Great Artiste arrive over Nagasaki. The bombers are spotted, but mistaken for U.S. weather planes. No alarm is sounded, and the city's 270,000 people continue as normal. Sweeney signals the start of the radar-guided bombing run. Just before the radar drop. I've got it. I can see the city. You own it, BN. The crew switch to visual bombing. Eleven oh two AM. from 28,900 feet. The two planes immediately turn to escape the blast. I heard the roar of a plane. I thought it was strange because the air raid warning had been lifted. And just as I looked back... force of 22 kilotons of TNT. Fat man generates heat of over 4,000 degrees Celsius and winds of up to 1,000 kilometers an hour that surge across the city. I let out a great scream. I only remember up to there. Great Artist circles over Nagasaki, recording the blast effects of the immediate aftermath of the explosion. We all went up and looked out, and uh, we seen it. The moisture room just kept billowing out. And uh, there was a smoke trail from the base of it on up. In Nagasaki, Utter silence. 6.7 square kilometers of the city have been reduced to rubble. More than 40,000 men, women and children are vaporized. Seventy thousand more 
are injured. I got up and looked around. Everywhere I passed through, all the houses were destroyed. Only the last house I delivered post to was left. In the shelter, Sakui regains consciousness. The tunnel was filled with people whose eyes had popped out and were dangling down by their noses. Somehow, Sakui's sister and nephew also survive. Her thoughts now turn to her mother. The city is strewn with burnt bodies. This body with the gold tooth must be Mum, I thought. Oh, Mum! And I cried, touching her hand. But as I touched her, her body crumbled away. Sumitero looks for help. And as he walks, I looked at my hands, and the skin on my left arm, from the elbow to the fingers, was hanging down like rags. There was something black that stuck to my hands. Over 100,000 people were killed instantly by the atomic bombs dropped on Nagasaki and on Hiroshima three days before. In the following months and years, thousands more Japanese die from the radiation released during these attacks. Five days after Nagasaki, America's president, Harry Truman, calls a press conference. I have received this afternoon a message from the Japanese government I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. The war in the Pacific is over. The two nuclear bombs seem to have done their job. Certainly, America argues that they were necessary to prevent a land invasion of Japan that could have claimed tens of thousands of U.S. lives. This becomes the accepted story. But after spending 10 years scouring U.S., Russian, and Japanese archives, historian and author Tsuyoshi Hasegawa has come to a very different conclusion. The bomb was used, you know, to save American lives. And therefore, no matter how horrible it was, it was justified. This is a myth. Now, by rewinding the events of those fateful weeks and going deep into the archives, we will uncover the true story of the bomb and its effect on the surrender of Japan and the end of World War II. December 1941. Japan launches a surprise attack against the US fleet at Pearl Harbor. Two thousand four hundred and two US servicemen perish. It's the opening salvo of a battle that will rage across the Pacific for four years.
this war kills over two million Japanese soldiers and civilians. And at least 100,000 US soldiers. The Americans wanted to terminate the war as quickly as possible. By the end of 1944, US forces had secured the Mariana Islands. It gives them runways within bombing distance of mainland Japan, allowing devastating air raids against the enemy's industrial hubs and densely populated cities. Over 60 of them are reduced to ashes. It's hoped this will force Japan into surrender. Instead, the Japanese pursue the strategy of Ketsugo, total war. This Ketsugo operation was a horrifying operation because it is designed to turn every soldier, every civilian into kamikaze. The idea was to inflict enough damage to break the American morale. U.S. military leaders know Ketsu Go would inflict massive casualties on any U.S.-led land invasion. Hence their decision to use the bomb. For many years, Americans were encouraged to believe that the choice had been starkly between the bomb and the invasion. That stark belief is historically incorrect. Historian Barton Bernstein believes there was a clear third option. Invade Japan on two fronts with a powerful ally. Since 1943, the Americans have been trying to persuade their Russian allies to tear up their neutrality pact with the Japanese. A two-front attack from America and Russia would force Japan to spread her troops more thinly. Soviet entry into the war might speed the ending of the war and reduce the number of casualties for American forces. In July 1945, U.S. President Truman meets his Soviet and British allies at Potsdam in defeated Germany to discuss post-war Europe and the end game in the Pacific. Stalin revealed that the Soviet Union was going to join the war against Japan by August 15th. Truman expects the war to end once Russia joins the invasion. That night, he even writes in his diary, Stalin will be in the Jap war on August 15th finished Japs when that comes about. A land invasion of Japan is now a viable option. America has what it wants. Japan will be crushed on two fronts and US losses will be minimized. But Hasegawa believes that just when Truman gets the Russians on board, he has second thoughts. By Postum, the conflict between Western powers and the Soviet Union became very tense about Poland, Eastern Europe. After Germany's surrender in May 1945, Soviet forces mass in Eastern Europe. They make a huge and flagrant land grab, occupying Eastern Germany, the Baltic States, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania and Bulgaria. Russia is growing powerful. For America, too powerful. Truman and his advisors fear that if the Soviets enter the war in the Far East, they'll snap up huge areas of Asia as well. Truman faced a dilemma. Whether or not he should welcome the Soviet entry to the war. Soviet entry into the war would obviously save American lives. 
at the same time at the cost of allowing Soviet expand. Truman is stuck with an ally he doesn't trust. But he sees the opportunity both to end the war before Russia comes in and to show them the military technology now at America's disposal. With nuclear weapons. One bomb is ready to go. Another one is being tested in the New Mexico desert. On July the 21st, Truman receives the report on the test. The test was much more successful than they had ever expected. Truman was elated. With the atomic bomb, he could finish the war without the Soviets. But for this to happen, the U.S. need to drop the bomb before August the 15th, the date on which the Soviets say they will join the war. Truman asks his advisers to quickly issue the Potsdam Declaration, calling on Japan to surrender unconditionally or face utter destruction. Japan's leaders ignore it. Now, there's a race between Soviet entry and, and atomic bomb. On August the 6th, 1945, America drops Little Boy on Hiroshima while the Red Army is still mobilizing its troops along the border with Manchuria. Stalin was shocked to learn the United States used a bomb so quickly. And so he thought, this is it. The atomic bomb would force Japan to surrender, and the game is over. And he was very depressed. Спасибо, Vladimir. Stalin believes his goal of expanding the Soviet Empire into the Far East is over. But then he gets an urgent message from his foreign ministry. The Japanese want Soviet assistance. Japan is still continuing that policy of seeking Moscow's mediation to terminate the war. For Hasegawa, this message confirms that the Hiroshima bomb did not persuade Japan to surrender. For Stalin, this message is a lifeline. The Pacific War is not yet over. He immediately ordered the Soviet military to start the war. On August the 9th, whilst preparations are underway for America's second atomic bomb to be dropped. One and a half million Russian troops cross the Manchurian border. The Red Army quickly overwhelms Japan's thinly spread force. Within hours, the Japanese army abandons Manchuria's capital, Changchun. Japan's high command holds an emergency meeting in the bunker under the Imperial Palace. The Soviet entry into the war forced the Japanese policymakers to face the possibility of surrender. Asagawa believes this is the first time surrender is seriously considered. Japan's ruling Big Six is made up of the three doves of the peace party and the three hawks of the war party. Despite having seen their navy destroyed, their air force decimated, their troops die in their thousands, and hundreds of thousands of civilians killed by fire bombings and the Hiroshima bomb.
they have refused to surrender. Everybody had to sacrifice if they were killed. Well, that's too bad, but that's a part of the war. But the main obstacle for the Big Six is America's terms. Our demand has been, and it remains, unconditional surrender. They fear it will mean the end of their imperial dynasty, the embodiment of Japan's sovereignty and identity. They interpreted the unconditional surrender as a destruction of the emperor system. And that they could not accept. The big six are desperate to retain the emperor and the imperial system. But the hawks and doves pursued different strategies to secure it. The war party plans to inflict so much damage on the Americans with Ketsu Go that they will compromise on their surrender terms. The peace party tried to mediate for peace through the Russians. When the Soviets invade, both plans are crushed. Soviet entry into the war uh, totally destroyed the hope of peace party to uh, terminate the war with, through Soviet mediation. For the military, it destroyed the hope of carrying out the defense of Japan because they are not prepared to fight the Third Frontal War. Meanwhile, as the Red Army advances, Boxcar is airborne. A second nuclear strike is underway. In Tokyo, the war party is still defiant. They reluctantly agree that surrender might now be inevitable, but it cannot be unconditional. To the peace party, the attaching conditions will be tantamount to continuation of war, because that will never be accepted by the United States. 10.56 a.m. Boxcar and the great artiste have reached Nagasaki. They start a bombing run. In the Imperial bunker, discussions are ongoing. I've got it. I can see the city. You own it, Behan. The argument between the war and peace parties becomes heated. <laughs> AM. Fat Man explodes, 3.2 kilometers from the center of Nagasaki. Thirty minutes later, news of the Nagasaki bombing reaches the high command. It did not change any dynamics. It did not affect anything. The two parties continue to disagree on the surrender terms. The meeting adjourns. It looks like once again the war party has succeeded in postponing surrender. Asagawa discovers that the Soviet invasion has a huge impact on the peace party. The Red Army is fast approaching Japan's mainland. The peace party believe continuing the war is very likely to have devastating effects for the emperor system. Communism and emperorship are not compatible. Under Soviet influence, the emperor system will be in peril. The Peace Party believes that the more pragmatic Americans are more likely to keep the Japanese Emperor after surrender than the revolutionary Soviets. And so appeal 
to the one person who can impose surrender upon the army, the emperor. But persuading him to do it won't be easy. He's the figurehead of Japan's military campaign. Japanese soldiers are taught that their duty is to fight for the emperor. They should fight to die. You're not going to just put the white flag and surrender. For the emperor to now argue in favor of surrender would be a devastating shock. At 10 a.m. on August the 14th, the High Command reconvenes in the Imperial Bunker. This time, the Emperor joins them. Japan will surrender unconditionally. This is a blow to the war party. Traditionally, the Emperor always sides with his faithful army. The Emperor thought to accept the army's position would bring the Imperial House down. On August the 15th, 1945, Emperor Hirohito announces his decision to his people. Hasegawa believes it's not the horror of the atomic bomb that leads to Japan's surrender, but the threat posed by the Soviet invasion. Soviet entry into the war really made the emperor realize that how dangerous it is to continue the war. To Barton Bernstein, it makes the second atomic bomb dropped on Nagasaki after the Soviet invasion a tragic and entirely futile act. The Nagasaki bomb did not make the difference in speeding Japan towards surrender and thus a bomb was dropped unnecessarily, killing perhaps as many as 60, 70,000. Now, having delved into the archives, we can reveal the series of events that led to Nagasaki being hit with America's second atomic bomb. Nineteen days to disaster. Nagasaki is spared from America's deadly fire bombings. While Sakui Shimohira and her sister sleep soundly, President Truman receives a report confirming that America have viable atomic weapons. bomb will save US lives but also kill thousands of Japanese civilians these deaths never appear to be a consideration if we work through the archives we cannot find a single time when Truman or Secretary of War Stimson or those closest to those two men ever raised the question should the bomb be used. August the 6th, 1945. Three days to disaster. America's first atomic bomb is dropped on Hiroshima. In a single flash, snuffing out 80,000 people. Two days to disaster. Japan's leaders are still desperate to see if the Soviet Union can mediate a halt to hostilities, rather than Japan surrender unconditionally. Preserving the imperial system is their top priority. 
Just as with the Americans, what is not taken into account is their own civilian population. As far as the army is concerned, civilians getting killed did not really matter. 12 hours to disaster. Russia rejects Japan's request for its mediation and declares war. Nine hours to disaster. Although another nuclear bomb now seems an irrelevance, the superfortress Boxcar takes off from Tinian Air Base, carrying Fat Man, a 4.9 ton nuclear device. Their targets, Kokura or Nagasaki. A horrific body count of innocents appears inevitable. But the US are more interested in testing their new weapon and maintaining an upper hand over the Soviets. By 1945, World War II had become virtually a total war in which the constraints and restraints against targeting non-combatants had been progressively eroded. After years of brutal fighting, any normal sense of humanity seems to have disappeared on all sides. Six minutes to disaster. Boxcar starts a bomb run over Nagasaki. Fat Man is released. 43 seconds later, at 11.02 a.m., thousand die within seconds thousands more die of radiation poisoning but for survivors like Sakui and Sumiteru it's a living hell soon afterwards everyone began discriminating against us they said things like you're dirty don't come near us. This show, I stood on the train tracks two or three times, but I jumped back each time. I have to go on living, even if I'm alone. If I die here, there will be no one left to put flowers on everyone's graves. There's no one else like me. No one was directly hit, suffered such severe injuries, and spent three years and seven months in hospital. I have to see the end of nuclear weapons with my own eyes. I have to live until then.